In this video we're going to look at two short poems by the provincial Latin author, poet, Marshall. Marshall uh, came from Spain and was writing in the second half of the first century AD. He specialised in short poems, very witty poems, sometimes quite sarcastic and sniping poems. These poems are called epigrams. And he was writing about upper class society. He is very often making fun of the immorality uh, of the upper class lifestyle. And he's really useful for us because in his poems, he can sometimes concentrate on the problem of the ideal behaviour of rich people and the actual behaviour of rich people. And we are going to uh, have a look at that in the uh, first poem that we are going to see. So uh, this poem, The Power of Love, as it's translated, uh, is about a woman called Livina. And Livina is going to be seen to be a rather uh, lascivious, lustful woman who is uh, led away from her husband by a younger male lover. What's interesting to me is that Livina is named, as she's clearly the centre of this poem, and the men aren't named. And very often in Roman Latin literature, we don't get the women named, so it's rather nice that she is named. But actually, when women are named, when their name is in the public domain, it normally means that they're quite scandalous. And Livina is scandalous. She is going to be compared to women in Greek and Roman mythology who are themselves seen as either ideal women, and we'll look about what that uh, idealism is, or non-ideal women, troublemakers. And we're going to see how Livina falls from being uh, an ideal woman to being a rather um, immoral woman herself. So we know that in Latin poetry, the first line is the first word of the first line is really important. And here you can see the caster. Caster means chaste. So we know that the key theme of the first lines of this poem is about chastity. Now chastity or celibacy means not sleeping around, not sleeping at all uh, with, with a sexual partner or perhaps only sleeping with one sexual partner who ideally is your husband. So Livina is chaste, chaste no less than the Sabine women of old. Now the Sabine women are uh, an, the women of a neighbouring tribe of the early Romans, the Sabini. When Romulus in the myth founded Rome, he founded it uh, with men uh, to help him build the city. And they found uh, after a while that they needed women, surprise, surprise, to make new citizens of this women. Of this city. So they don't have uh, females with them, they're not being, they're not invited as one, so they decide to uh, steal them from their neighbouring tribe, the Sabini. The Sabini are invited to visit them to come for a festival and athletic games and at a given signal the Roman men come and steal the Sabine women. We don't need to go any further into that uh, Myth, but you should know that the Sabine women are seen as models in Roman mythology of very chaste women, women who didn't give up their virtue easily to the Romans. So Livina at the beginning of the poem is as chaste as these mythical Sabine women. So she is the ideal Roman uh, wife. In fact, we then have the Tetrico Tristio. She is actually even uh, more austere, Tristis you'll probably know is sad, but more austere here than her ever so stern husband, her Tetrico Vero. And noticed how the Tetrico Tristior 
you've got to play, <coughs> excuse me, alliteration on the T sounds there to heighten the, uh, the fact that they are so uh, severe and moderate in their behaviour. In fact, she's more moderate than her husband, more severe than her husband. And that uh, comparative adjective is a kind of ironic foreshadowing. She's really severe at the beginning of the poem, but she's going to turn up to be someone who falls from grace. Now, in the middle two lines, the modo, modo, uh, uh, going with the two names for uh, the lakes, the Lucrino and the Averno, uh, Lucrinus uh, and Avernus, which are lakes in the, around the Bay of Naples. Uh, they are uh, volcanic lakes down there. Uh, we've got, now she goes to the Lucrine Lake, that's the modo, modo again. Then she goes to Lake Avernus, and when she's there, she demit it. Now, demit it is, you probably know the verb mito, which is to send. This is to send down. So she lets herself down gently into the waters there. And she goes often the modo modo, because that's the kind of luxurious holiday life that she has. But the demit it serves as a, uh, a hint that when she, she doesn't just let herself into the water, she lets herself down in her behaviour. After the modo modo, we then have the dum. While she's at Baiae, now Baiae is a really um, a famous uh, centre of hot springs, the Baianis Aquis, so the hot springs at Baiae, also in the Bay of Naples. When she goes to uh, the Bay of Naples to the hot springs, which is a great fashion resort that everybody knows about. She um, foverta, she gets pampered, she begins to warm up, actually. That's what that means. So the warming up here is foreshadowing of the beginning of the next line. So she literally warms up in the warm water, but she's getting a bit hot sexually too. And then, in kidit in flamas, Look at the repetition, the repetition of in, in, the assonance there. She falls into the flames, and the flames that she falls into have got nothing to do with Mount Vesuvius. They are the flames of love. Look at the emphatic positioning of Inkidit there at the beginning of the line. That's to emphasise the fact that she just quickly falls into the flames of love. So we've had this building up of the picture of someone who's being really moderate, has a lovely luxurious lifestyle, but the luxury leads her to wander from the path and fall into temptation. So inquitted in flamas just means to fall in love really, but the flames is picking up on the hot waters of the springs at Baiae. And after the colon, which is a modern imposition by an editor, never talk about the uh, editing of the punctuation in these poems. That's not there in the Latin, so don't waste time writing about that. You're not going to get any marks for that. Let's have a look. We've got relicto conjugue. conjugue. That's an ablative absolute. With her husband being left behind, conjugue, the beginning of its line, emphatic position, uh, then that's all masculine. The relicto is a PPP. Then we've got circuita, feminine, at, at, uh, another PP, P, or, well, a PAP, because sec was a deponent verb, isn't it? Having followed her young man. So we've got the young man leading, the wife is following, and left behind is the husband. And you can see how the word order there brilliantly mirrors the actual movement in the relationship. And then this fantastic chiasmus at the ending, she came a Penelope, she went away a Helen. Now, Penelope and Helen are two great women from the Homeric myths. Um, Penelope is the wife of Odysseus, who is an absolute icon of chastity. Uh, she, as I'm sure you know, uh, waits for Odysseus for 20 years, keeps her lovers at bay by weaving during the day and undoing her weaving at night. So she came to these luxurious holiday destinations as a very good, chaste wife, a Penelope, and then she goes away a Helen. Well, that's Helen of Troy. Helen, wife of uh, King Menelaus at Sparta, who falls in love with 
the Trojan Paris when he's visiting uh, the city and elopes with him and then is the cause for the whole Trojan War. So a disastrous negative view um, of uh, the most hated woman in Greek myth probably because of all the problems that she causes in one sets of the Greek myth as well. So um, that's kind of hyperbolic, isn't it? She came absolutely perfect. She went away absolutely uh, a terrible, terrible woman with no morals whatsoever. It's a beautifully balanced poem, really funny, uh, and setting up this named woman, Livina, to be critiqued at, laughed at, but maybe her husband's being laughed at too. He takes her on all these luxurious holidays and he can't keep uh, control over her. And that's a typical of some of the themes of the um, first century AD where too much luxury um, corrupts and it particularly corrupts women because they don't have the natural restraint to be able to deal with that much luxury. Our second poem is one of the most famous epigrams from the ancient world. Unbearable and agreeable. Well, that's not a great translation, is it? Difficilis faculis. Difficilis is a compound word of faculis, difficult, easy. Those, the sound patterns of those juxtaposed words are fantastic there. So there they are, two third declension adjectives. They can identical in the masculine and the feminine. So we start off, I think, uh, assuming, um, if the reader is male perhaps, that he's going to be talking about a woman. You're difficult, uh, but you're also really easy. Ace idem, you are the same. Jucundus acerbus, another juxtaposition. You're pleasant, but you're bitter. You're, they have pleasant and repulsive equally. You are at the same time Jucundus, joyful maybe, and acerbus. I like to have bitter, something that's a bitter pill to take. Um, and those are both masculine. So now we know that the author or the reader is thinking about a male lover not a female, which you might have thought with Difficilis Faculis. So this poem is great. It works for straight women, gay men. This is a terrific poem. And uh, just don't forget that in the ancient world, uh, same-sex relations, just as in today's society, they happened. Um, they are normal. Um, and this poem serves to show us that. So here we have a male author writing about a male lover. Now, we have the whole big thing of, do I think that uh, Marshall is gay, bisexual, whatever? Is this meant to be autobiographical? Or is it just uh, a poem that imagines a woman reader? Goodness me. Nec tecum possum vivere, and we were and neck neck neither nor, neither am I able to live with you nor without you. So you have this beautiful um, pattern of the te, te, um, the we were uh, in the middle, I can live, I'm able to live. And then it's just a beautifully balanced phrase. And of course, the great thing about this poem is that it talks to all humans who've ever had a relationship with anybody, whether it's parent, whether it's a sibling, whether it's a beloved, um, this is one of the great poems that talks about how we love people who drive us mad at the same time. I think it's really important in this collection of poems too because it brings in homosexual love where most of the re relationships that we've been looking at are actually heterosexual relationships. So I think it's very important that we see this voice of homosexuality from the ancient world. If you're fortunate enough to be able to do A-level Latin, at A-level you'll probably come across many more uh, poems, uh, texts uh, about bisexuality, homosexuality, heterosexuality. But uh, it's great that at GCSE we have got examiners who address those by putting in a poem 
from the ancient world which doesn't show that it's homosexual in its translation. English can't do that unless you put a word like man in there. And that's the absolute beauty of having gendered uh, adjectives. So you've got these lovely uh, juxtaposed adjectives in the first line, beautiful balance, and then you've got the balance of the final uh, line with the te and the te around the possumuere in the middle. It's an absolute cracking poem and uh, let's hope it comes up in the exam.